Hello, I'm John Harrington. I'm a trustee of the SLSA and a member of the executive board. And I'm delighted today to be able to speak with Professor Kate Bedford of the University of Birmingham. Kate won the SLSA Hard Book Prize in 2020 for her monograph, Bingo Capitalism, The Law and Political Economy of Everyday Gambling. Um, it's a great pleasure to have you here today, Kate, to talk about the themes, the inspiration, um, the achievement of, of your book, its background, and perhaps the significance for socio-legal studies. It's really lovely um, to get a chance to talk about the book, and, and thank you. And thanks to the committee, I was, um, I was so, so chuffed when I heard that, um, that, that, that the book had won the prize. That's great, Kate. That's great. Um, I wonder if you'd uh, talk to us a little about the background to the book, what's in it and how you came to write it. Um, sure, yes. Yeah. So, so the book is uh, uses bingo to think about feminist political economy and feminist social legal studies, um, tries to think about a new approach to gambling and political economy. Um, that relationship between gambling and political economy, between what we think of as legitimate speculation and the illegitimate sphere of, of gambling, those, uh, that relationship and those boundaries have been quite foundational for um, political economy, particularly cr critical political economy. And the book tries to reinterrogate that relationship, but using the example of bingo, uh, rather than the, the more standard um, metaphors of gambling, particularly where you see a lot of comparison between casinos and stock markets or poker and high stakes business risk taking. Um, so the book starts from a very different place, uh, an everyday, much more vernacular um, form of gambling, much more associated with women, uh, with working class people in many parts of the world with indigenous um, uh, First Nations people uh, as as well. So um, it starts from a very different place. And in terms of where the, the book comes from, so it comes from a couple of places. Um, the, it, it, it comes partly from having been brought up with people who played a lot of bingo. And I talk about that a bit in, in the book. Um, but academically, um, it started off as a very small project that I'd actually imagined as an interlude to, uh, I'd finished my previous book on um, uh, gender sexuality and, and the World Bank um, that was looking at international development lending. And I was a bit done with writing about the World Bank at that point. And so I thought I'd take a brief interlude uh, before returning to something on gender and development, I thought. And, um, there was a, a lot of conversation at that point happening about um, the 2005 Gambling Act. It had just come into effect in 2007. Then we had the financial crisis and there was a, an awful lot of conversation happening about gambling. A lot of politicians, including David Cameron and Obama, were um, talking about the financial crisis using the lens of, of gambling in the to talk about irresponsible speculation. Um, so lots of conversations about casinos, lots of conversations about stock markets and gambling. And I was just really interested in thinking about what this would all look like if we started from a, a different place. So I did a tiny project with 300 pounds of internal funding, looking at the impact of um, the 2005 Gambling Act on seaside bingo regulation. Um, and the book came from there. Really, that little grant became a slightly bigger grant and then really quite a large grant with the ESRC that funded uh, the fieldwork, both in England and Wales, which this book is based on, and then also a team of other researchers who are working in other places. Well, it's very encouraging, Kate, to see such a substantial uh, and highly regarded project and book coming from a 300 pound internal funding award. And it's great as well, I mean, to, to talk about my own response to the, the features of the book that you've talked about, the, the sense of, of rootedness that you convey uh, about, about your own experiences 
growing up, as you've mentioned, but also as a researcher, the affinity uh, that, that, that you clearly show with the, the people of different backgrounds, genders, and so on, that you, that you interview in the book. And I think that the, the, one of the great strengths of the book, one of the, the things that keeps the reader turning the pages is, is the, the ethnographic and, and qualitative work uh, with people who play bingo and, uh, and the people who work in the sector. I think you pay, you pay great attention to both of them. You mentioned there this um, distinction in a way the attention of policymakers um, in, in the mid 2000s in the new labor period uh, being directed to casinos and online gambling and high capital uh, forms of, 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 of gambling and the relative neglect of bingo. Uh, I wonder if you'd say something about the history of that because I think the earlier parts of the book give us a great introduction to how bingo was actually very prominent in gambling, and then how it faded away and the, the gendered, classed, political economy processes that led to that happening at Westminster and beyond. Yeah, um, I, uh, so bingo used to be absolutely central gambling. In fact, it was bingo um, and advocacy related to bingo from working men's clubs in the 50s uh, that led to first uh, to, to a really quite significant um, set of uh, gambling law reforms in the 50s which late 50s which then um, led to a, a explosion really in the commercial bingo and other forms of gambling in, in the 60s and when the um, state cracked down on gambling in 1968, it did so in a way that tried to control casinos, but that actually uh, very much left the working men's club dimension of bingo, which was always about mutual aid. So it wasn't charitable gambling, it was mutual aid gambling. It left that pretty much um, untouched. So unlike the heavy clampdown that we saw in the late 60s on casinos. Uh, Non-commercial bingo escaped relatively unscathed. And for quite a long period of time, bingo was the, particularly mutual aid bingo, was the, it was the acceptable face of gambling. It, it mixed the virtue of community and self-directed community. Um, and that was accepted by both conservative and Labour Party politicians. So that shifted under Thatcher, uh, who, whose um, assault on mutual aid wasn't just done through coal and unions, but it was also done through a broader assault on mutual aid gambling, which um, I have a chapter of the book that, that talks about. Maggie's Den, um, as the uh, bingo term is for the, the number 10. And what happened to uh, bingo under, under Thatcher uh, when the lottery was promoted? So we had a we had an um, investment in ch charitable gambling, firstly through the society lottery form. So it, Thatcher didn't, didn't create the national lottery. That came immediately after her, but she set the stage for that. Um, and mutual aid forms of gambling like those in working men's clubs really came under serious state surveillance and scrutiny and they were really restricted in their activities. Um, and then the last stage in that eclipsing was under, um, was under Blair and New Labour, where as you say, the attention focused to Americanized spectacles of destination resorts that were about casinos and also the desire to position the UK as at the forefront of the the e-commerce frontier through liberalizing online gambling and so it was those two sectors that really um were underpinned the the, the major reforms in the 2005 gambling act um, and bingo was pretty much eclipsed from eclipsed from view but not in practice in, in everyday life it continues um and it, it st still continues it's very resilient but in the eyes of policy makers, lawmakers, elite actors, we, we see just Hansard records just trail off basically from, 
from uh, from Blair onwards. Thanks, Kate. And I, I, I think those dimensions of the book um, speak to British social history. I know uh, you're very careful in the book about saying what disciplines you're not doing and which ones you're combining. And we'll come to that. But I you know, couldn't help thinking of the work of someone like David Kiniston on post-war Britain. I know it's incomplete, but, uh, and, and you also say you're not writing a maudlin or melancholy history of the working class in a way, as you suggested there, you show the resilience, um, the, the, the survival of bingo through different configurations of gender and class power uh, intertwined at different moments of Britain's post-war history. But there is a sweep to the book, which I think, uh, which I think readers will enjoy. I'd like to take you back to this uh, new labor moment um, and this idea of casinos which figure, um, James Bond is mentioned and the Wolf of Wall Street and what goes on in the Wolf of Wall Street. And that's counterposed the kind of Hollywood uh, representation of gambling, which the political elite in Britain was buying into uh, in the 2000s, is counterposed to a, a mundane everyday world, uh, one which is, you know, differently gendered, to say the least. I, I'd be very interested to, to hear a little more about your approach to that and what you found in, yeah. in the research, um, what's in the book on that. I think there's a real, that's, that's a really interesting question in part because it speaks to a real tension in the book um, between count, counterposing those spectacles and those dominant elite conversations about gambling and political economy, casinos and stock markets, James Bond figures, um, does poker make you a good businessman, those sorts of conversations. Um, counterposing those to um, rainy seaside afternoons in arcades playing bingo, um, you know, late late night sessions in in commercial halls or in legion clubs, um, and they in, so there is a bit of a tension there because they those of course they are very diff different representations, and I am obviously offering a different representation of, of, of gambling, um, and I do think that those dominant narratives need a little bit of disruption by by pointing out their partiality. I have to say, if I see another film about the financial crisis that involves men in Vegas and where the only women are naked, I, I think I, you know, I might, might sort of laugh out loud in the cinema really. So those sorts of dominant narratives really do need quite a bit of disruption because you need to point out their partiality. But the, the, the tension though comes in the fact that the key theme in the book is about the entanglement between the states visions of political economy and risk and welfare and insurance and ordinary everyday experiences of vernacular play. Um, so there's not a, a counterposing to the, in, in a sense of um, the everyday sphere being insulated or pure or uncontaminated from that, that realm of state political economy and state regulation. It's the co-constitution that I'm trying to draw out in, in, in the book. But sometimes in order to point out that co-constitution and the importance of the everyday realms of gambling, then you need to point out the, per the partiality, I suppose, of the dominant um, representations. But there is a bit of a tension there. I think that's absolutely fair. Thanks, Kate. And, and um, that entanglement is something that you bring across very well, the, the co-constitution of the mutual mutual aid context and the philanthropic uh, and the capitalist world, the market and, the, and the, 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 the quite capillary interdependence of them um, that comes out particularly, I think, in the field work. I wanted, I suppose, to bring you to another feature of the book, which you talk about, you flag up very much, in the introduction and again in the conclusion. And that's this idea of the 
allegedly at least diminutive nature of what you're studying, it's only bingo. Uh, your review of Hansard through debates shows bingo is used as a term of abuse. Quite surprising for a reader, you know, it's a it's a cipher for Britain's deindustrialization. It's a cipher for the feckless working class. Um, but it, you you bring out and you, and you foreground this understanding of bingo as something a minor and diminutive, and you your field work, your qualitative work, uh, speaks to the self perceptions of the people playing bingo uh, and working in the sector, uh, almost self-effacing and um, relativizing what they're doing. And I'd be very interested to know whether you think there's something for students of method and methodology in that, this idea of modesty. I mean, is it something you, you had to engage with yourself and work through? Um, yeah, it's it, um, the the issue of how to how to write about a sector that laughs at itself, and where respondents in interviews would just you'd tell them that you're doing research on bingo and they they would laugh and you would ask them about their you'd say you want to talk to them about what they did and they'd respond with an absolutely typical uh, self-effacing, self-deprecating comment, like it's not rocket science. Um, and the, the, the methodological insight, I suppose, is the absolute necessity to just scratch behind that. <laughs> um, so that, that's just the obvious methodological lesson, lesson never, never believe working class. Uh, people when they tell you that they're nothing special, um, which any working class academic will um, just know inherently. Um, but if it needs to be taught as a as as as, as a methodological insight, then uh, we can do that too. Um, but I think more broadly, I suppose the academic significance of the self-effacing and self-deprecating nature of, of of the sector is that it. One of the arguments in the book is that bingo, both as a practice but also as a, as a lens on political economy and, and social legal studies. It gives us, I think, a really interesting vantage point on diverse economies, the capitalist ones and the mutual aid ones and the, uh, and the ones that are a mix of the two, in precisely because it's populated by people who insist that they're nothing special. Um, and I, I do think um, methodologically that orientation towards the this, this sectors of the economy and of society that, that um, are characterized by that self-deprecation, that self-effacement, it, 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 it's, it's really, really quite important for academics to pay quite a lot of attention um, there uh, and to really seriously interrogate the skills that are involved <laughs> in, in that sector. So one of the arguments of the book is that the skill versus chance um, distinction that's quite central to uh, gambling uh, law and policy, that that distinction is a gendered and classed distinction that if we pay close attention to the labor involved in running bingo games um, and in creating bingo atmospheres that are recognizable to players and in reattuning technologies that have been designed by people who've got really no um, deep involvement with the game, we are tuning those technologies to uh, vernacular play practices. All of that labor is, is such skilled labor um, and it's gendered labor and it's class labor. And uh, we need to be able to pay attention to that. And the only way we can do that is if we're interested intellectually in the, what, what's happening with the self-effacement and the self-deprecation and the different roles that it's playing in, in, in our conversations. Did that answer the question? Very much so, Kate. Yeah, I, I, I think you were a bit self-deprecating in terms of methodology to start out with, but I think you've, you've clinched it very much. <laughs> Um, that's 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 really very interesting and, and something people watching us uh, in the social legal community and beyond will be very interested in, as well as the substance 
of the book in terms of regulation and political economy. And I want to take you in a kind of penultimate uh, question uh, to a, a phrase you use in the book at least once, which is the idea of having a tenacious socio-legal curiosity. Um, what is it? How do we get it? And I suppose, how does it, how, what did it, what was its payoff for you as someone who comes with a political economy background, doing research on political economy? What do socio-legal methods and approaches add to this? Um, yeah, that, 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 that tenacious, um, that tenacious curiosity. Um, so I, uh, in part, learned how to do that through the work of a social legal studies community that certainly in my, my first book having been trained in, in, in a different discipline I hadn't been um, exposed to and I'm exceptionally fortunate to have worked now in, in two law schools with in the UK with scholars who um, have that curiosity and in a broader community of, of, of scholars both in the UK and, and many other places around the world where I've, I've learned from their work what it means to pay close attention to the rules, um, to the implementation experiences, to the non-compliance moments, to, the, to, to a pluralist account of the rules as well, which is something the book really does try to, to, to center. So it does take state law um, and regulation, of course, very seriously, but, but it also looks at, at um, you know, training manuals from companies and the rules that bingo players um, and workers enact um, every day when they play. So that, that attention to the plurality of the rules um, is, is part of the tenaciousness. I, I think you don't, you, don't, you don't stop at the Hansard piece for me. Um, <laughs> interesting though that was, you don't stop at the case law. Interesting though that was, but that's that's not where the, um, that's not, the, the, that's not enough of a full picture, I think. Um, and I have been so struck by what that lens can add to studies of critical political economy, really. Um, I, and the attempt in the book to mix those two conversations together or to bridge in a way those conversations, see what happens when, when we bring their insights to, together. Um, it was one of the most rewarding, certainly one of the most challenging, but one of the most rewarding parts of, 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 of the project for me. Um, I do think that critical political economy needs some socio-legal um, disruption. Uh, some more attention to the rules, some more attention to the regulations, some more attention to what law, to ha how, not, not just how law works, but to what, how we figure, how, how we understand power operating through and as law. Um, so I talk about that quite a bit, bit in the book when I talk about regulation. So I, I think in terms of what the social legal can do for that area of study, I think it can do an awful lot actually. Thank you, Kate. That's really, that's heartening and it's, it's great to hear. And I think it's definitely demonstrated throughout the book that interdisciplinary, genuine interdisciplinarity, not just bureaucratic interdisciplinarity, but actually being done and uh, with great productive effect. I guess my last question loops back to uh, our opening discussion about your background, your research background, which uh, had been before this project on global political economy, feminist global political economy, the World Bank. Um, I'm interested in terms of whether there are connections, whether there's a relevance of this project. Um, maybe the methods point you've made very clearly, but in terms of the substance, um, is there a way of feeding back? And, and indeed, what, what are you working on now, I guess, would be the, would yeah, be the um, final question. I, um, uh... I think, like most academics, I'm, I'm, I'm str struggling to work on uh, work on anything research-wise at the moment, to be honest. But um, there, there are absolutely some actually quite direct links between my past work on 
international development and gender and then there's more contemporary work on 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 gambling liberalization in fact in some uh, places the world bank promoted tourist resorts with gambling attractions as development strategies so actually the link were i to have the time and inclination i think that would be that would be one obvious way to to bridge um th those conversations um in terms of what i'm doing Oh, oh, I'm hoping to do to carve, carve some time out to to, to do um, next with this is um, I, I'm, I'm doing some work on E.P. Thompson's uh, and James Scott's work on on moral economy, uh, where it's well known that they they talk about alcohol quite a lot. Both of them talk about alcohol quite a lot. Alcohol is central to both their understandings of the moral economy, and so I'm trying to think about what would happen if gambling was like alcohol in those, those accounts. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to think about that through the context of some pandemic era changes in gambling regulation um, that we see not, not just in, in, in England and Wales, um, but in, in some other jurisdictions as well. So I'm doing a, a, a bit of work um, on that at, at the moment, um, and I'll, I'll see where that, where that takes us, um, I suppose. Thanks very much, Kate. That's great to hear. And we wish you the very best with all that work and look forward to seeing it coming out in presentations and further publications. Thanks. So th thank you very much, Kate, for this conversation today and for introducing you, introducing us to this uh, splendid book. And congratulations again on winning the Hart um, Socio Legal Book Prize in 2020. Thank, thank you, you, Kate. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you.